compare baseball from back then to right now. Back then, he was a raw rookie among future Hall of Famers. But right now, he's achieved immortality on the mound in his own right. Back then, the Mets were lovable losers celebrating their start. But right now, they're wondrous winners celebrating an anniversary. Back then, the Brewers had veteran bangers with proven power. But right now, they've got youthful pitchers with surprising poise. Back then, a lengthy game was wild and wacky. And right now, we'll flash back to that scene. So let's go there and then, right here and now. Here we go, y'all, on This Week in Baseball. Celebrating our 10th anniversary. Happy 10th anniversary this week in baseball, and uh, here's uh, wishing you good luck on another 10. Spotlighting the American League. California's Don Sutton makes history. One and two, the count to Gary Ward, two outs in the ninth. He's one strike away from 300 victories. He went around, and it's over. A three hitter to beat the first place Rangers made 41-year-old Sutton the 19th pitcher in big league history to win 300, crowning a career now in its 21st season. In 1966, Sutton came up with Los Angeles, joining an outstanding staff that included future Hall of Famers Sandy Kopax and Don Drysdale. Well, we were obviously three different types of pitchers, but they had been there and they had enjoyed uh, amazing success. So I would watch Kopech pitch and uh, I would watch his style of pitching because he was basically a fastball curveball pitcher. And I was too more curveball than anything, but I could learn a lot from him about his style. And Drysdale was the more gregarious, outgoing type, and he was very open with information about anything from where to eat to what to tip, you know, what to wear. And both of them uh, were very helpful to me, and, and neither one was selfish with their time or their information. And for a young guy, it couldn't have been a much better situation than to play with those guys. But Sutton surpassed them both, winning 230 games in 15 seasons with Los Angeles, plus playoff World Series and All-Star Game victories, and he holds team records in eight categories. I own most of the Dodger records. Uh, starts, games, uh, shutouts, wins, tied for complete games, strikeouts, those are all very important to me much more important with that organization than they would be with most others because uh, when you think of Dodgers, you think of pitching. And you think of the names of Koufax and Drysdale. They had put the numbers there, and they were numbers to shoot at, and I wanted to stay there and pitch well enough to get them. And it means more to me to have them now that I played with those two guys than it would if I, hadn't, if I had never known them. In 1981, Sutton signed with Houston as a free agent, won 24 games in less than two years. Going to Milwaukee in September of 82, winning five out of six down the stretch, including the division clincher in Baltimore on the season's final day. Traded to Oakland before the start of 85, he came to the Angels in September of last year. Sutton has struck out at least 100 batters 20 straight seasons to set a major league record. And now, with 300 victories, he feels he's also set an example. I would like to think that what it would do would put a stamp of approval on my way of doing my job. I know that I'm not spectacular. I know that I'm not flamboyant. I know that I am not a dominating pitcher. But I worked very hard at my trade. I worked very hard at staying in shape. And I worked very hard at staying a good ball player. And I would hope that it would encourage some people who don't have the ability of Dwight Gooden and Nolan Ryan and Tom Seaver to go out and to battle and to put together a good career. That's what I would hope. You've certainly done that, Don. Congratulations. See you in the Hall of Fame. Next up, New York, where the Red Sox kept rolling against the Yankees. Shades of the 78 Boston collapse to New York? Not this time, as the Sox put down the Yankees with ease in game one. Red Hot Roger Clemens tossed a complete game four hitter to go 12-0, a team record for consecutive wins from the start of the season. It put the 23-year-old Clemens just one win away from the 13-0 start posted in 1978 by New York's Ron Guidry, who, by the way, suffered the loss for a career-high six straight. Guidry was also the last pitcher to beat Clemens in August of last year. 
Clemens got loads of offensive support, 16 hits and 10 runs. Jim Rice led the way, three for five with four RBIs. At age 33, still has a young spirit. I go out and I try to make this game fun. I don't go out and try to make this game work. When you have a tendency of making it work, you have a tendency of losing the kid that's in you. I want to be just known as an everyday ball player, a guy that goes out and busts his butt, and a guy that not probably can do everything, but doing the best with his ability. That ability showed in game two when Yankee smiles turned to frowns after new third base coach Don Zimmer sent slow running Butch Weininger home from second with nobody out. And Rice nailed him at the plate, preserving Boston's one-run lead. Joe Sambito got the save, giving up three hits, no runs, as New York left 15 men on base. The Sox won game three on a ninth-inning bases loaded double by Don Baylor to pad their lead in the East. On to Milwaukee, where the brew crew appeared almost good as new. Nobody figured Milwaukee for much this year after two poor seasons, but instead the Brewers are making a surprisingly strong showing to bring back memories of Harvey's Wallbankers, the 1982 team that blasted 216 homers for manager Harvey Keene and captured the American League pennant before losing the World Series to St. Louis in seven games. The club those years could hit the baseball and hit it hard. And they were a home run hitting type ball club. If you want to sum up that club and this one, they had the power. This club is more or less a singles double hitter with exceptional young arms that can keep you in a ball game. I think the pitching right now is better than they had in 82. However, 82, they could hit the home run and blow you out much quicker than we can right now. Robin Young typifies the team's transformation. League MVP in 82 with 29 homers, 114 RBIs. This year, the power stats are down, but he's batting 370 after completing the move from shortstop to the outfield. Well, I enjoy playing center field. Last year, I was in left and didn't care for it too much, but if you have the speed to cover the ground, I think it's an easier position to learn, and uh, I think I've caught on a little quicker there than I did in left. He's a great center fielder. He's a great athlete. In other words, I think no matter where I play the guy, he's going to do a super job. Right now, he's really, yeah, I think he likes the outfield. I really do. Will he play shortstop again? I can't say. At the present moment, no. Because I don't think his arm is really that strong. Yet, he can throw pretty good from the outfield. Much the same for Ben Ogilvy. Not close to his 34 homers and 102 RBIs in 82. Yet, hitting for a best ever average above 340. But good young pitching is the real key to a renewed brew crew. For example, 21-year-old rookie Juan Nieves is so far 6-2. and two. Fellow rookie Dan Plesak has come out of the bullpen for five saves and four wins, while second-year starter Teddy Higuera had nine wins, a 2.3 ERA, eight complete games to lead the league, and 98 strikeouts to rank second in the league. All these young kids, we didn't bring them in because they were young. We brought them in because they do have talent and they had success in the minor leagues. So we said they're ready. So let's make a bunch of moves, get these kids up, get their feet wet. In a year or so, we'll be fighting for the pennant again. Now, let's open the notebook for this week in baseball's Twib Notes from around the American League. For Texas Ranger Charlie Huff, a game loss that was mighty tough. Two outs away from pitching a no-hitter against California, Huff was facing Wally Joyner after a three-base error that allowed Jack Howell to reach third. The no-hitter is gone, and it's a tie game. After out number two, Joyner went to second on a pass ball, setting the stage for a most bizarre play on a pitch to George Hendrick. Got him, but it gets away. A play at first. Orlando will not throw it, and the run scores, and the Angels win on a strikeout. Nobody covered home. Sorry, Charlie. Tony La Russa's White Sox haven't had much to cheer about this year, but in a loss to Seattle, there was one play that gave Chicago a smile. That's hit to left. Harrison coming on now stops. There's the catch. Here comes the throw to the play. It's going to be close, and they get him. The throw to Atkins, and they get him. A triple play, and the inning is over. How do you do? Baltimore speedster Alan Wiggins was on first base, and Tiger manager Sparky Anderson wanted to keep him close. 
So catcher Lance Parrish threw down, but Wiggins got back in time. Then pitcher Randy O'Neill threw over, but Wiggins again got back safely. O'Neill tried yet another pickoff attempt, but this time first baseman Dave Bergman faked the throw back to the mound, held on to the ball, tagged out Wiggins easily with the old hidden ball trick. How about that? In Baltimore's previous series, Juan Beniquez hammered three home runs in one night against the Yankees. Although New York won the ball game and went on to take three out of four from the Orioles to move back into second place. Just a week earlier, Baltimore's Lee Lacey belted three homers in one game in New York. Now, this week's quiz brought to you by Nissan, who invites you to test drive the totally new 1987 Nissan Stanza at your Nissan dealer now. Kansas City's Willie Wilson committed two errors in four days after going 163 straight games without one. Now, for this week's quiz, who holds the mark for most consecutive games without an error by an outfielder? Stay tuned for a man who played on six teams in 11 years. National League. The New York Mets in the East are out of sight. The amazing Mets are mowing down opponents left and right, charging off to the best record in the majors with 44 wins in their first 62 games. This is the Mets' 25th anniversary, and the 86 club has already won more games than the 62 team did all season under inimitable manager Casey Stengel. Everybody has to fight for a job. The coaches have to fight for a job. I got to fight to hold this job, too. I have to have this club better. We can't just go along and, and uh, feel sick after each ball game, and I don't want to get sick after ball games. I love to win myself, and I think these men are getting so, they're getting better. What you told me have to find the first five or six starting pitchers that are going to be on the New York Mets. My pitching staff is outstanding. That was going to be a strong suit we had going into the season, and it's, and it's bad. We know In other words, if you can hit or if you can run, why well, you're going to become very valuable to the club and help the pitching staff. When I touch you, it's gotta be for good, only if we could. But we don't want to use coaches. We're trying to make you so perfect that you wouldn't need a coach. Public in New York supported the ball club. They were loyal for years and years to the New York Giants. They were loyal to the Brooklyn Dodgers. We only had one team there, which was the Yankee team. It was doing splendid in itself, but they wanted to see another team come back into the field. And why shouldn't they go out and patronize? There's too many people in New York City. It's a constant problems in town, in which when you go into a city of that size, there should be more than one entertainment. A long way from then to now, but the Mets figured to celebrate by making this a sensational silver anniversary with the pennant. And now let's review this week in baseball's twib notes from around the National League. Chili Davis has been spicing up San Francisco. His three-run ninth inning homer not only beat Houston, but also gave Davis the league lead in RBIs. In the four-game series, he had 400 with six RBIs, and he had a total of 48. The Seesaw Series with first place in the West at stake also saw Houston's Phil Garner supply home run heroics with a grand slam, the 100th homer of his career. Each team won two games in the series as the Astros remained atop the division. Rafael Ramirez faced Los Angeles with Atlanta down by one in the last of the tenth, and he doubled home two runs to win it giving the Braves an 8-1 mark in extra inning games. One reason why they're in the Western Division chase. Gene Michael was named Chicago Cubs skipper after Jim Fry was dismissed in the league's first managerial move this season. Michael was ejected from his first game and the Cubs lost, but they won their next two. For parts of 1981 and 82, Michael managed the Yankees, and he was their third base coach when the Cubs hired him. 
Now, let's find out the answer to this week's Nissan quiz. Don Demeter played 266 consecutive games without committing an error. The big league record for outfielders. Demeter played on six teams in his 11-year career, setting the mark with Philadelphia and Detroit from late 1962 through mid-1965. Hey, man, wake up and face the music. Because let's face it, it's not easy saving face after fouling up in the field. are going to do an about-face. Oh, man, get out of my face. in the face of such frivolity. Time now to get serious and put on a game face for some fancy fielders that gave fitters hits. I mean, hitters fits. First up, Los Angeles pitcher Tom Needenfuhrer. Doing it anyway, which way? Dodger teammate Reggie Williams. Toronto Blue Jay, George Bell. New York Yankee Mike Pagliarulo. Atlanta's Bob Horner. Boston's Marty Barrett. Seattle's Harold Reynolds. California's Wally Joyner. Montreal's Tim Wallach. Detroit's Dave Collins with a double dip. He got it. One more time now for Dodger Reggie Williams. The Yankees again with Dave Winfield. Baltimore's Juan Beniquez. And finally, an Oriole encore, John Shelby. Now it's time for this week in baseball's 10th anniversary flashback. Brought to you by Gatorade. Let's flash back to 1985. On July 4th, the weary New York Mets played the beleaguered Atlanta Braves in one of the longest and wackiest games in memory. After two rain delays, everybody was beginning to get, well, a little bleary-eyed. By the 13th inning, the lead had changed hands five times. And with the Mets up by two, it was well after midnight when Terry Harper batted with the man on base. And the 0-2. There's a drive to left. If it's there, if it's there, it is there. It's a tie ball game. Harper hit the foul ball. So the teams played on and on and on. In the top of the 18th, New York scored again to go up by a run. And in the bottom of the inning, Atlanta pitcher Rick Kemp was forced to bat because the Braves had already used all their pinch hitters. It'll be an 0-2 pitch. And he is at the deep left. He goes back. It is gone. Holy cow. Oh, my goodness. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. That certifies this game as the wackiest, wildest, most improbable game in history. The one thing I'll never forget about that game, uh, it was only, I think we only had nine guys left on our team to play. But a guy on our team that probably had the worst swing of anybody in baseball by the name of Rick Camp came up in the bottom of the 18th inning. We need one run to tie. He's pitching, he's throwing, and we really don't have anybody left. He's got a hit for himself. 
and he comes up and hits a home run to tie the ball game in the bottom of the 18th inning. I don't think I'll ever forget that as long as I live. But there were several other things that happened in the game. Uh, of course, uh, two major rain delays uh, ran the game into um, almost five minutes to four in the morning. Uh, then at about 4.01 or 4.02 in the morning, they fired off the fireworks because it was supposed to be a 4th of July celebration. Well, there was a lot of fans that um, were still in the stands waiting for that. But then there was also the ones that were woken up by, by the fireworks and all were calling the police station saying they were being invaded or, or what have you, or bombed. But uh, uh, that's one game that I'll, I'll never forget. Ron Darling was used in relief, and he faced, you guessed it, Rick Camp in the last of the 19th. What swing and a miss! Uh, Rick Camp strikes out, and this ball game is over. The final score, 16 to 13. Latest ending game by time in league history. And that's all for now, folks, but see you next week on This Week in Baseball.